Are we sure nobody wants to come and sit in the front row? but for the benefit of the people watching around the world. Welcome to Timucua. My name is Benoit. This is our living room. Thank you, thank you. This is concert number 878. We've been doing this since uh, September 2000, and uh, we hope to do it for another 20 years. It's going to be 20 years soon, I guess. I'm thinking ahead a little bit. But we are planning on the, on the up to 2040, so... Uh, Hopefully, you guys will be around to come and see some concerts then. No, but we have expansion plans, and it's all in our plan, that the 20-year plan that is coming. Like, it's taking shape now. We can't divulge it yet. It's se yeah. top, top secret stuff. So, um, uh, well, you probably need to know there's three bathrooms. Of course, that's the exit in case of emergency. Very important. Please silence your cell phone and disable the flash. I will turn the proper lights on. I'll just keep talking. The people online, they can still hear me. So, yeah, exactly. I'm wireless for a reason. There you go. Uh, what else is there to know? Uh, we have a nonprofit called the Timucua Arts Foundation. By the way, people across the world, like Les Gens du Québec, uh, welcome. Uh, we hope you enjoy the show. It's going to be a great, great, great concert. Uh, the artist this month is Veronica Ankerern. And she is Swedish, and she will paint live tomorrow night for uh, Elena Ulyanova, who is a, a, a Russian pianist. Uh, Elena is going to be playing some uh, Beethoven, the 14th and 23 uh, uh, sonatas, and um, two preludes and a sonata by Rachmaninoff. And so she will be playing the stuff that she really knows well, and she's a good player, actually. And uh, so you can come to that. Now... I don't know exactly how Veronica makes these. I've s she's shown before. Like uh, I've known her for like 12 years, maybe 11 years. And I've seen photographs, I've seen oils, and these are watercolors. And all of the small pieces in the lobby, by the way, they're all originals. And they're $30 ones, they're originals. It's pretty cool. You can get an original painting for 30 bucks. I mean, and the slightly larger ones are 60. And uh, the, you know, the, the most expensive one here, I think, is 400 or 450. So it, whoops. That didn't work. I meant to do this. There we go. Um, you don't want to watch those during the concert, but before it's very important. Th those are our uh, supporters, and we need to uh, you know we need you to uh, support them. Now, what I know is that she has requested this riser be here tomorrow night and perfectly level, and I believe she paints on plexiglass. And I think maybe she just like once she's done. She puts the paper on top, and that's what it's... I don't know. I'm guessing. You'll have to come to find out. But I've, you know, I can imagine that could happen. So, anyways. So this, this is her work, and of course, all the pieces in the lobby are also her works. Uh, the other works that are not lit are, were done, 99% um, of them were done uh, during events. So we have been doing this for quite a while, and sometimes this one I purchased, and sometimes people give the piece to us and stuff, so that's pretty cool. We're pretty lucky. We live, we live a good life. So, uh, any questions? No? You're welcome to ask questions after the, the concert. Like, that's perfectly fine. It's uh, not a very uh, formal uh, happening here, as you can see. It's pretty casual, and uh, we hope that, plus, you know, Saturday afternoon, we always hope that young families and young people will come, and people of all ages will be uh, informed, as well as entertained or mesmerized or perhaps have your life changed forever. I don't know how to say that in, in, in one word. But, uh, but anyway, so uh, if you're ready for some music, then please, you're going to have to be uh, boi boisterous, loud. Yeah, so uh, just help me welcome the Brendan, uh, Brendan Robertson Quintet.
Thank you. Thank you. How's everybody doing this afternoon? Yeah, I'm enjoying this crowd right here. Don't worry about the people next to you. That's, that's already filled in. Don't worry about all that. Thank you all for coming out on this beautiful Saturday afternoon, joining, joining myself and my wonderful comrades here. My name is Brandon Robertson. I'm uh, the bass player and the band leader. And you're listening to the Brandon Robertson Quintet. I'll take a quick second to introduce the members of the band. The gentleman to my right, we just met for the first time today, and he is amazing. And I've had the pleasure of hearing great things about him, and he is doing such wonderful work over in the Tampa Bay area. You're listening to Mr. LaRue Nicholson on guitar. <laughs> also to my right, the gentleman on the keys is one third of the popular band, Central Florida band, La Lucha and he has performed here with various groups as well as his own. He is a staple in the Tampa Bay area and he is my, one of my really close musical brethren for the rest of my life and I love this guy. This is Mr. John O'Leary on piano. So the gentleman that's standing in front of me, he is a very accomplished saxophonist, does have a college degree in composition, a master's degree in composition as a matter of fact. And he is also, oh, Ravinia, was that, is that the jazz camp or was that an institute? institute? Institute, yes. So Ravinia is an institute that's held in Chicago, I believe. And uh, is it Chicago? Yes. And they invite some of the best of the best in the country, uh, college students. And he was part, he got a chance to participate in, during that camp. Our institute, I believe Rufus Reed was one of the staff that was on there. Um, who did you study with? Uh, Rufus. Rufus, okay. Rufus that's Charles. Billy Childs, okay, great. And so uh, this gentleman here is also another staple in the Tampa Bay St. Pete area. He teaches private lessons and he's doing wonderful things over there. Give it up for Mr. Zach Bornheimer on tenor saxophone. And last but not least, the man himself, the GOAT, the urban legend. This gentleman has led various groups in the Tampa Bay area that has been all, uh, uh, very over successful. Mosaic is one of his latest projects, is a dedication to the Art Blakey group. He recently formed what, what he deems as the Writer's Corner, which he would like to grab a bunch of the best of the best musicians from the area and collectively present their own original music. Um, he teaches private lessons, he performs all over the state of Florida, and I'm sure he's performed here various times with other groups. You are listening to Mr. Paul Gavin on drum sets. So, so the first song that you heard was a song off of my album, it's entitled Fat Friday. Just a brief backstory about that song, Fat Friday was the very first song I ever wrote. I was 18 years old when I wrote that. Uh, I went to New Orleans in 2005. I was a freshman at Florida State, and uh, I got a chance to leave Florida for the first time. I had never left Florida, so it was a culture shock when I got to New Orleans, and I was like, wow, okay, there's a whole lot more outside of Tampa. <laughs> so um, the one thing I remember was the music. I just remember hearing music on every corner. There was music everywhere. The food smelled fantastic. Just never been around that kind of uh, environment. And Sadly, five months after I got to visit New Orleans, Katrina hit. So um, I got to see New Orleans in its pure essence in its last form before everything had changed. So I wanted to write a song dedicated my first musical experience leaving Florida, and that was Fat Friday. So this next song we're going to do is a classic standard written by Brooks Bozeman, who was a young composer, um, died very early. Um, but a good story about him, about him was this song that we're about to play was actually Princeton's theme song, it was their first theme song, and he wrote it for, for the school. I don't know if they still use it now, but it was the school song back then. This is a classic standard, East of the Sun and West of the Moon. Thank you. 
Thank you. Mr. John O'Leary on piano. I got introduced to that song by my former piano professor, Bill Peterson from Florida State. He used to play that song a lot. In uh, my second semester in graduate school, uh, we were doing a lot of compositions from the Tin Pin Alley era. And this tune came up and when we played it, I was like, man, this is really bass friendly. He's like, yeah, you should probably learn the melody and play that on your gigs. And then I've been doing that ever since. <laughs> And uh, Mr. Gavin here actually suggested at our last show that the three of us played on, he's like, you know what? You should play that as a duo. You don't need me. <laughs> AKA, let me get paid to just sit here and do nothing. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it was actually a really good idea because the crowd really loved it. So kudos, I have to get cre credit when credit's due. So this next tune, um, it's another composition off of my album. Uh, the backstory behind this one, this one's very dear to me. Um, a really cool story. Back in 2013, I was touring with a band uh, called uh, the Zach Bartholomew Trio. Uh, Zach Bartholomew, who is currently a adjunct professor down at University of Miami, um, at the time he and I had just graduated from Florida State in undergrad. We had put a trio together. We had been touring for a while. In 2013, Zach decided to say, you know what, guys, enough of this road stuff. I'm going to go get my master's degree. I don't know about you, but I'm not going to be lazy anymore. And so he went and got a master's degree. And because I watched him go through that process, it kind of put that weight on me. Like, man, I can't be lazy. I, can't, I don't want to be behind. And so I was contemplating if I wanted to go back to school. And rest in peace to my mother-in-law. But at the time, um, I had this conversation with her. This is back in 2013. And she had said something so profound to me. She said, you know, when you and Angelica, who's my wife, um, she said, when you and Angelica decide to have kids, you want to you wanna figure out what do you want to leave behind for them. So if you think that you can achieve that by what you're doing currently, then, then don't let nobody change your mind, but just think about that. And that put a lot of weight on me. So as I did that, uh, I was in the process of writing this song, and it wasn't until about midnight when I came to the final resolution of this song, which this song helped me make my final decision to go back to grad school, which that was the best decision I made because I ended up getting the job that I have now down at FGCU. So um, this is entitled Peace by Midnight. And this is also on based on the true story, which is available outside for all purchases. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you. How you guys feeling so far? Hanging in there? Cool, cool, cool. You know what, you know what we dig about playing original music is that we get to be more expressive because it's our original music. So, you know, if I want to frown at a happy place, I can do that because it's my music, you know, but I won't do that. That's misleading. <laughs> but um, so far, uh, I will say that this album has, has really been doing well. And what I'm most excited about getting the music out to everyone is this is a, a audio biographical, um, basically like a, a, a life story, me telling my story for the last 14 years that I've been a professional musician. And you know, I've gone through a lot of trials and errors, a lot of trials and tribulations, but overall where I'm standing right now and the man I've become today, I'm very proud of. And you know, my bandmates can attest to that, my colleagues at the, the university I teach at, teach at can attest to that. And so each song just has a significant meaning and a push to get me to where I'm at. So this next song, which is also featured on my album, um, anybody in there know who Thelonious Monk is? You would be surprised when I ask that question at gigs. People are like, Monk, where's he, where's he, where's he pray? I'm like, no, <laughs> no, no, not that guy, not that kind of monk. Um, but so when I was in college, when I was in undergrad, I got to study with the, one of the greatest jazz pianists of our generation, uh, Marcus Roberts. He was one of my professors at Florida State, and uh, he is the master of playing Thelonious Monk music. And one semester, I was placed in his jazz combo, in his student combo, and we did all Monk's music. So I got to learn all the, about the different bass players that had played with Monk, um, particularly Larry Gales was the one that I had got assigned to study. And so one of the songs that was assigned to me that I had to learn was Bishma Swing. And that song sticks, is, is to this day, it still sticks with me forever particularly the recording uh, live at Tokyo. And I had to transcribe the whole record. I had to transcribe all of what he was playing bass on. And from my studying through Monk's music, I realized that no wonder people didn't like playing Monk's music because it is hard, but it's simple. It's like really simple. Like when you look at his music on a chart, like a bass part, it's so simple. But then when you listen to the bass player played on the record, it sounds a lot more complex than what I'm looking at. And so this song is misleading, because on the page, if I showed you the, sh the sheet music, it looks simple. But when we play it, haha, <laughs> different story. So without further ado, this is my dedication to the great jazz master who taught me how to play rhythm and swing. This is Mr. Thelonious. Thank you. 
tried my best to get as close to Monk as I could on that one. So uh, that one's a little groovy. I like play. I like playing that one because I can really like just. I can just really lay it down. So uh, so this next one, we're going to slow things down. I hope you guys don't fall asleep because the lights in here are very soothing. So please stay with me. <laughs> so this next song, um, one of the things, one of the proudest moments in my life was becoming a father. Uh, I have two beautiful children. Uh, I have a daughter and a son. Uh, my daughter is actually turning four next Saturday, and my son will be turning uh, two in June. Um, so they're growing, they're growing fast. I want them to kind of hurry up so I don't have to keep paying for daycare. <sighs> Shout out to all the parents that have grandparents with them. <laughs> so this song, um, the melody, believe it or not, if you guys will actually believe me, it's gonna be hard to believe, but my daughter whistled this melody when she was one years old that we're gonna play for you. Um, obviously, I had to tweak it because, you know, her, her pitch tone is kind of off. But I was able to, she, she whistled the rhythm, and I said, baby, where'd you learn how to do that? And she's like, um, the baby bum, the little baby bum. The, they, they, they have these little cartoons that they have on Netflix called Little Baby Bum, and the little bus would whistle. <laughs> so when she was one, she was trying to figure out how to whistle, so she started whistling this rhythm. So on the intro of my CD, you can hear her talking. She's asking for me to play her her lullaby. And she's like, Daddy, can you play my lullaby? And I was like, of course. And then we go right into the song. So this is a dedication to my daughter. And this is entitled Lullaby for Noel.
Thank you. That was Lullaby for Noel. Uh, so this next song um, is also featured on the record. Pretty much all the rest of the songs are for, off the album. <laughs> um, this next one is the second song that I wrote, like, ever. Um, and I had the chance to write this when I was in Barcelona. So one of my first professional gigs that I got was working on a cruise ship. I got to work on Prince's Cruise for six months. And uh, I was literally, I graduated fall of 2009, and then I left in September. Like, I graduated August, I left in September and went to Europe. So I was 23 years old, and I had, again, culture shock when I left Florida to go to New Orleans. It was even bigger culture shock leaving the States to go to Europe. <laughs> and then realizing that, wow, they actually love jazz a whole lot more over here. They, they really appreciate this music. <laughs> so that was, a, that was a big thing. When I was in Barcelona, I got a chance to meet a, a local band there, and they were playing this kind of like this, I call it a Spanish ting. It always reminded me of the opera Carmen, you know, that, that kind of, dun, 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 dun. it kind of had that sound. So you'll kind of hear that embellishment in the melody. And this is uh, entitled Majestic Nights. Picture yourself at a beach with a mojito.
Thank you, thank you, thank you. cut is it on the album <laughs> however if you guys would like for me to come back you let Benoit know then we'll set a date and then I will premiere that song because that song is actually going to go on my next album but don't worry because I have another song that we're playing in this set that is going to be on the next album that I'm premiering here so you do get to hear something new so this one is actually the single that's off of my album. Um, I wrote this song when I was in grad school. Um, uh, I studied, I took a semester of jazz theory and arranging and that was the hardest class I took in grad school. Simply because I'm a bass player, not a pianist. So I think everything from the bottom up. So it was very hard for me to write voicings because I wanted to put root positions in everything because I'm used to doing that because I play bass, I play roots. And so it was a challenge, but this class, uh, particularly this song is, a, is an embellishment or an influence from a Kenny Wheeler uh, trumpet player, um, a Kenny Wheeler tune entitled Smatter where uh, he, he does these kind of metric modulations throughout the song. And every person that has played this song has screwed up the end. <laughs> and he's laughing because I tried to fair warn him. I was like, it's very deceptive. You won't, you won't catch it unless you're paying attention. Oh, I got it, Brandon, don't worry. <laughs> it happened in sound check. <laughs> so this song is supposed to feel like a never ending loop. So this is my uh, version of Smatter. It's not, a, it's not the exact version, but it's an it's a, it's a influence from it. And this is called The Next Thing to Come. Hope you enjoy. Thank you. 
Thank you, thank you. It's a little tricky. <laughs> See, I wrote this song with the intent to trip up the horn players for the sole reason that they never consider the rhythm section when they play 12 to 13 choruses on the blues. And after a while, after like four choruses, I think I got what you was trying to say. But you gotta keep going. And this hand is like, I'm not a jukebox, you know? So if I write something that they get mad at me about, it's like, now you know how I feel when I'm back here just doing this the whole time. <laughs> Nothing is, but he's great, so he can handle it. So I'm not worried about Zach. <laughs> um, so we only have time for maybe two more songs. So we're gonna go ahead. So, yeah, so, so I, I, I wanted to make sure we was over-prepared. You know, you never want to come to a, a show under-prepared, and then I'm like, hey, guys, well, 30 minutes in, I guess that's it, folks. <laughs> that's all I got. <laughs> so um, this next song was, is the very last track off of my album. Um, I actually did this one in the studio the day that we were completing the mixing of the album. And we were going through the songs and my engineer, Adam, was like, man, you know, you don't have anything on here about your son. And I was like, well, he kind of was, you know, one date too late when he was born because I had already finished the record. <laughs> so uh, he's, like, he's like, well, why don't we just do something right here? So I wrote a song right there on the spot in the studio with him. I just wrote it. It's just, uh, just an acoustic bass. And uh, I call this Maven's Arrival. And the, the major tonality is supposed to, if you want to imagine like the, the, the first time that a baby opened their eyes and they see the parent and that connection between the parent and the child, that was the connection I had with my son. And the doctor was like, you know, your son must really love you because as soon as he looked up at you, he just smiled. You know, my daughter didn't do that. My daughter went, ah! You know, but he, but he actually didn't cry. He just smiled. He just, he was grinning from ear to ear. Man, that touched me. So um, this is uh, a song I wrote for him entitled Maven's Arrival.
actually, uh, what's cool about that, the first time I uh, performed at live was with uh, John and Paul, and Paul was nice enough to record a little video, and was crazy. I'm gonna try not to tear up saying this because it was like a really, it was a proud moment I had as a father, but uh, I played that video for my son and my son started crying. Like, like it was like, like he was smiling, but he was crying. And I never, I never knew that music can make a, a, an infant feel that way. Like I'd never seen that before. Like he was, he was crying, but he was smiling and it was freaking me out because I'm like, are you, did I make you sad, son? And he just was like, because he was, he was watching me play and you know, and I was talking about the song, so I didn't realize maybe he was understanding some of what I was saying, but through the music. So it's just to show that even music at that age, music can be powerful and you know, you can feel it, the emotion. So I thought that was really neat. So um, this last song that we're gonna end, thank you all for being a very tentative audience, by the way. Very much appreciate you spending your Saturday afternoon with us. I hope the music has been fantastic for you. Um, this last song, I'm gonna invite the band back up. And this song is going to be on my next album. This is going to be the single on my next album. It was supposed to make this album, but, be, but because of uh, Hurricane Irma, uh, was it Irma that came and hit South Florida a couple years ago? Yeah. yeah, well when Irma hit, I was in the middle of recording this and I lost all the, the data, the, the recordings for it, the original recording, so I had to, I re-recorded it, but then at this point I had already finished the record. So this is gonna actually be the single to my next album, and it's called The Pursuit, and then you'll see why it's the next single. Thank you all for coming. I will be outside after the show if anyone wants to talk. I have CDs for sale. You get these cool little magnets with my face on it. Just kidding. <laughs> but it has the social media stuff, so if you wanted to follow where I was. And uh, yes, once again, Paul Gavin's on drum set. <laughs> Zach Bornheimer on tenor saxophone. John O'Leary the third on piano. And LaRue Nicholson on guitar. I'm Brandon Robertson, and thank you guys very much.
Thank you guys very much. Thank y'all very, very much. Again, Paul Gavin, Zach Bornheimer, John O'Leary, and LaRue Nicholson. I'm Brandon Robertson. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.